the main thing we're going to do today is look more in depth at some of the issues with virtual memory that we started talking about last time. We do have a challenge winner for the get a determined number of page faults from a program. So um, Michael will present that. Here's a recap of what we talked about last class. We looked at how memory works, where you're using pages to provide this virtual memory abstraction that you can access physical memory with. The operating system can limit what pages can be read. So part of the bits that are flags here are permissions, whether you can read or write to a particular page. And if a process tries to access a page that it's not allowed to read or write to, that will lead to an error. So how does this design work? So we argued last class that it was not surprising that the way this was designed, the page table fit in one page. Do we think that still works today? So how well would this design work from my laptop that has a 64-bit operating system and 64-bit addresses? Do you think we can still fit the page table in one page? Yes. Good. OK. The answer is no. Yes. I should give you a sticker for that since it was probably not such a hard question to answer no to, but you answered it so enthusiastically. It's not going to work. So why is it not going to work? Remember, this was designed for 386. Right? That's what we were looking at the architecture of last class. What were computers like when they were designing a 386 processor? So this was 1985, 1984. Very dark, distant days to all of you. Pretty distant to me, but I actually remember what computers were like then. This is what computers were like for the 386. This processor came 1985. At that time, you could get a megabyte for about $500. That's what it would cost to purchase a million bytes of memory of RAM. And the computers that were being released around that time, so the Mac, the original Mac came with 128 kilobytes. The first version of Windows was you know, incredibly bloated, and people thought you know, very few people had machines that could run it because it needed 192 kilobytes of RAM. And those of you who have been looking at processes like what Chrome creates and how many processes it's creating that are all many megabytes of size should relate to how different things are today. That design made sense when you were thinking of machines that had you know, a few hundred kilobytes. Maybe if someone was really rich, they might have, have a megabyte of memory to reference. Because how, how, how big is the memory that you can reference with this? So we've got pages. Each page is 4K. We have a 12-bit offset. Right, our address was a 12-bit offset, and we had 10 bits to get the directory and 10 bits for the page table. Right? So this was 1,024 entries here, and this was 1,024 entries. How much memory can we access this way? So in one page table, we've got 1,024 entries, and each entry is a page that has 4 kilobytes of memory. What's the size of our, our address space? We should just be able to, to multiply those two. We're getting, so if we had 2 to the 32, that's only about 4 million. 4 million seemed like enough. If you're building a processor in 1985, getting memory was so expensive that only really rich people could imagine having a megabyte. At the top of line consumer machines that this processor was designed for were selling for a few thousand dollars with 128 kilobytes of memory. This isn't going to work today. Suppose we keep the same design. But now we want a physical memory instead of 2 to the 32. We want a physical memory, or an address space, not a physical memory. A physical memory is going to be too big. But we want an address space of 64 bits. So how big would our page table have to be if we kept the same design? The offset is the location within the page. In this design, we've got 12 bits. So we've got 2 to the 12 locations in a page. And if we had 2 to the 64 locations, we've got 2 to the 52 pages. Can we have two of the 52 pages? Our one page table, a, a 4K page, we could store 1,024 pointers to pages. 1,024 entries, each entry is a pointer to a page and the flag that's for that page. Okay. So if we need two of the 52 of them, how much memory do we need just to store the page table? So how big a page table do we need if we have a 64-bit address space? OK, good. So we need two of the 52 entries. If they're 2 to 52 pages, well, each entry is actually 4 bytes. So we would need 2 to 56 bytes just to store the page table. And that's pretty expensive. 
it's not just pretty expensive. It's ridiculously expensive, right? So we need billions of dollars worth of memory just to store our page table. Forget actually storing anything useful. So this design is definitely not going to work. So what do we do instead? If we have lots and lots of memory, how do we design our virtual memory system to deal with it? So what would be some ideas for ways we could have more physical memory without having all our space ending up going into page tables? So there's at least one really obvious answer that I hope someone will suggest. Uh, a way to move tables from the disk to main memory. So I think maybe what you're suggesting is the opposite. Like if we can store the page table partly on the disk instead of all in memory. That we, yeah. So that, that would be a good solution, right? So if the page table is too big, well, maybe we can swap out parts of the page table. Right? Some of that could be on the disk. So we don't need to store the whole thing in main memory. But of course, if we actually look for an address, we need to actually be able to get the page table. So we're in trouble if it's not in memory. What else could we do? Ah, OK. Good, yeah. So that's the most obvious thing to do. It right? would be to say, well, let's just make the pages bigger. Right? So the, the problem we had with 32-bit addresses, right? we were using 12 bits for the offset, and that limited the page size to 4 kilobytes. Why don't we just make the offset bigger? So let's add the extra 32 bits of our 64-bit address to the offset. So now we're going to have huge pages. Right? Our pages are going to be 2 to the 44 bytes big. And we're talking about you know, terabytes, probably more than terabytes. I don't know what 2 to the 44 is. Really big pages. So now we've got all our memory back. We've just got huge pages. Is that OK? Why not just adopt that solution? Good. Yeah, so it doesn't work too well with the hardware. right? So if the hardware is optimized for what we can store in caches, and, and when we read memory, we're going to read a whole page into memory from the disk. If every time we have to load a page into memory, we've got to read 2 to the 4, 44 bytes from the disk and find somewhere to store that in RAM, well, that's already bigger than we have in RAM. Right, and that's going to be very expensive every time we switch a page. So that's a, a pretty good reason not to do it. And the page size is, is also, you know, the bigger it is, the more memory we're wasting. Because the minimum amount of memory any process can get is one page. We don't want to waste that much memory. Okay, so what we want is something more, more like the solution. But that's going to be a little more complicated. And the way to do it is to have our page table on multiple pages. Right, we argued last class that it made sense in the 386 design to make all these sizes, to pick all these sizes, to pick the offsets and the, the number of pages, so it would fit on one page. That doesn't scale. So we do need more pages. And so the, the way modern systems work, usually, is to have a hierarchical page table. So you have a level one page table. This is always going to be in memory. And you've got nine bits that index into that page table. And that's going to tell you where to look for the next level page table. The next level page table, well, there are two to the nine of them. Some of those might be in memory. Some of those are not. Right? Those could be swapped out to disk. Those could be not present. They could be invalid. At each level, there's many page tables. And we're going to hierarchically go down that list. And if the page table we're looking for is in memory, great. If not, well, then we're going to swap that out from disk and get the page table. So this is the way to get larger memory spaces with basically the same idea we're just making the page tables hierarchical. There's several different ways of doing addresses in 64-bit x86, but this is um, probably the most common way. So you've got four levels of page tables, each with nine bits to access. And then the page size is still 4K. Once we go to 64-bit addresses, do we still need the segmentation phase? So if you remember what the segmentation was doing, it allowed us to divide memory into segments that, that maybe could overlap. And its goal was to provide programs with a nice kind of logical address space that would eventually be mapped to the linear addresses that matter for the physical memory. Once you have 64-bit address spaces, you really don't need this very much, especially if your most programs are being generated by compilers rather than by humans dealing with code at this level. So for most uses in 64-bit, there's still a segmentation step, but it doesn't do anything. The addresses in the program are the same virtual logical addresses as the linear addresses that go into the, the paging unit. Why is each page 512 entries instead of 1,024? This seems a bit of an odd decision, especially because there's 16 unused bits. I have no idea. 
Um, if anyone can figure it out, you should let me know. It seems like they should be 10 bits. Probably a good reason why they're 9, but I couldn't figure out what it is. These questions I think you should be able to answer, and we've sort of touched on this a little bit. So why is the standard page size still 4 kilobytes rather than bigger? And there are ways to get bigger pages on this 86. Is there a way I can easily tell on my machine what the standard page size is? OK, so here's all the, the processes running. It's a little hard to see, but at least people near the front probably can see. Does that list tell you anything useful to help understand what the smallest page I can have is? Does that list help you figure out what the page size on my, my laptop is? What if I uh, sort it? So it's sorted now from the biggest. So we see the things using the most memory are the kernel, the Windows server, which I, I think is running the UI, Emacs and PowerPoint, and other things that seem like they should use memory. If I sort it in the other direction, does that help you see what the minimum page size on my laptop is? Right, so we got a bunch of processes that are using 4 kilobytes. We don't have anything using less. There is a weird one using 0 bytes, and I have no clue why that would be. Well, actually, so it is using 4 kilobytes. We'd have to think a little more carefully about what all the different columns mean. But there are things using as little as 4 kilobytes. So that's one page. If our minimum page size was 2 megabytes, the least a process could use is 2 megabytes. And that would limit the number of processes that could be running if you need to give each one 2 megabytes. How well do we like this design? If your goal is to save energy rather than to save silicon, do we like this four-step hierarchical page table? So it looks pretty expensive, right? For every access to a page, well, we still have the TLB, right? So maybe a lot of time we don't have to go through all that. But certainly all the times that we do have to go through all that, every time we access a new address that isn't already in the TLB, this is pretty expensive. And it requires both a fair bit of time and more importantly, quite a bit of energy to store all that, all that memory and, and to go through all those steps. How would your design be different if you didn't want to pay all that cost? So is there any reason all pages have to be the same size? So why do we want pages to be the same size? Yes. OK, good. So, so it does make the design simpler if all pages are the same size. Right? And part of what we get by making all pages the same size is for every address, we're doing exactly the same thing. Right? We're always going through all these page tables to get to the right page. But there's no fundamental reason we can't have pages that are different sizes. It's just going to involve a little more complexity of the logic, maybe. Right? We might have, as part of the entries in the page table, we have a few extra bits that say, well, how big is that page? We could have some pages where, after two lookups, you go right away to a really big page, and you've got these extra 18 bits of address. Right? We could have other pages that maybe are small, but require going through, through those extra steps. Certainly, one thing you could do is have some pages be different sizes. That's going to be more efficient than requiring all pages the same size. And that still gives you the trade-off of having some small pages so you can have lots of processes, but having things more efficient so you can have some big pages as well. There are processors that do this. Most of what you've seen in probably both 2150 and architecture and this class up to now has really been very focused on Intel x86. I think that's the only assembly language that you deal with in 2050 and architecture. Is that true? Do you see anything other than x86? Yeah. You do MIPS, really? Does anyone use MIPS anymore? MIPS may have the advantage that it's nice and simple. In terms of what people actually use, it's pretty much all x86 until about five to 10 years ago, and now a lot of it's not x86. A lot of it is ARM. And if you look at the changes, the ones that are ARM look like they're taking over. So we definitely shouldn't be totally focused on just x86 anymore. Part of the reason ARM is taking over is because of design decisions like, like this one, that the ARM processor was designed as a, a much more fundamental goal to save energy, whereas the Intel design tradition until quite recently has always been get things as fast as we can and find ways to keep getting more transistors on chips and using them. If you're wondering who's winning, this is ARM. Intel is this one. Just for comparison, this is Google. So, oops, that's not how you spell Google. ARM's doing pretty well. And I should caution you, you shouldn't take stock advice from me. 
and I can't claim you know, that I was telling people back in 2009 that they should buy ARM. That would have been pretty smart. Now, I wasn't teaching operating systems back then, so maybe if I was, I would have been. What I was doing then was teaching crypto classes and explaining Bitcoin and what an interesting protocol it was and being really careful to tell my students, whatever you don't waste your money on this stuff because it's never going to be worth anything. So you probably should not follow my investment advice. ARM is, because it's designing low power processors, well, they're very, very useful in devices where we care about saving batteries. Processor in the iPhone, the latest iPhone 5S, is this A7 processor, which takes components from all sorts of different companies. So it's licensing the architecture from ARM, designed by Apple, manufactured by Samsung. Lots of it taken from, from the ARM processor design. If you look at how they describe that architecture, you can see this is from their description of the architecture, that you've got a few different addressing modes. And you have this four-level lookup like we showed, where you have to go through four pages, and you've got four kilobyte size pages. You also have a two-level lookup. And here you're getting bigger pages, 16-bit offsets. So each page is 2 to the 16, 64 kilobytes instead of four. And the pages that you use to index are also bigger. So now you only need two levels of lookups. You're still getting 48 bits of address space. So that's a lot more efficient. Now you're only getting 48 bits. We so said we've got a 64-bit address space. Some of it's reserved for the kernel. Some of it's, this is the 48 bits for applications. And a whole bunch of it is just wasted. Are we happy with that design? Should you go off and sell all your ARM stock now? That you realize they're wasting all of this address space. Well, we still have 48 bits, right? So that's 256 terabytes of addressable memory. Pretty good amount for most things we're doing with computers today. I like this quote from the review. Probably, you know, expecting memory to change by about 20 years from now, machines should have 256 terabytes. So that 20-year window is not that different from what happened with the 386 design. That lasted close to 20 years of, of being enough, and that's probably a, a reasonable window to, to design architectures for. They'll probably have a new version that doesn't waste, waste all that space by 2030-something. We're probably okay because your, your iPhone that you buy with your ARM processor probably will be replaced by then as well.